Good morning. All right, preview of coming attractions. There will be some audience participation in a few minutes. I just want to point out, however, uh, that uh, my esteemed colleagues who were on the stage earlier, uh, I agree with everything they said with, it, with one glaring contradiction, which is everyone knows that UC Health is University of Colorado and not University of California. So I have great issue with that. All right. So the other name for my talk is, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that, which uh, this movie was made exactly 40 years ago, which is astounding because the, if you haven't seen this movie, those of you who did not raise your hands earlier, go find a streaming service, stream this movie tonight, because it's incredible that the, the writers and the director of this movie um, presaged exactly what we're going through now, the consciousness or the pseudo-consciousness of generative AI being able to generate um, information in a way that may disagree with how we think about the world. Today I want to talk about four separate chapters, generative AI being the current fad, a bit about sepsis and something called predictive AI, and then chatbots and our experience using generative AI to reply to incoming online patient messages, and then a little bit about automation bias that you've heard a little before from a previous speaker. I want to point out that this past year, the Colorado Art Prize first place went to an artist AI partner. And this is a person who said that they spent about two weeks generating 300 prompts to teach the AI the image that it was trying, he was trying to create and then paint it on top of it. And this combination of a human AI was the first prize winner at the Colorado State Fair. And my question to you is, WTF? <laughs> what kind of age are we living in right now? So the social media tells us the future of medicine is awesome, and yet this is all we get. Some lousy doctor yelling at the computer in the corner while the dissatisfied patient's on the exam table. When are you going to be done with that computer thing? So our first chapter, predicting sepsis, how hard can it be? I'll give you an example of why sepsis is so important. 50 people every hour die from sepsis, which is a bloodstream infection. It's very difficult to detect and usually occurs unexpectedly in patients hospitalized for other reasons. And what's worse is it's getting worse. In the last 20 years, hospitalizations have doubled for sepsis in this country. We are not doing better. So here's an example of a case of in-hospital sepsis. To give you an example of how this works, there's a woman who's 47 years old. She has a, multiple fractures from a car accident. Her heart rate starts rising on day three, and blood pressure fluctuates, respiratory rate fluctuates. It's very difficult to pick this up in the context of a regular busy practice. You've got a dozen patients you're responsible for, you have thousands of vital signs readings, and no one spots this. And by day five, she tells you, I feel terrible. She spikes a fever of 102. The lactate, which is a blood test diagnosing sepsis, is drawn and it's high. And so with that diagnosis of sepsis, we immediately start the IV fluids, get some blood cultures, start the antibiotics. By day seven, respiratory failure, the, the, the disease continues to get worse. They go to the ICU, they're put on a ventilator, and by day 14, maximum support, cardiac arrest, and dies. This is a very typical example of how sepsis is discovered in, in a hospital stay. And the question is, could we have detected sepsis earlier? That's the premise. So we think about this. We have lots of data. We use the Epic Electronic Health Record. And we thought maybe we could use many years of data and pick up the patterns for every patient who had been diagnosed with sepsis within our health system, find these patterns, and then show them to the doctors and nurses at the bedside to intervene earlier. And this is my, what it might look like. And so in our first trial, we did what we call an ensemble model. We took what Epic Wisconsin had built as a sepsis model, and our data scientists within our organization at UC Health in Colorado built our own model, and then we combined them into an ensemble model and showed this aggregate score 
to clinicians, nurses, physicians at the bedside. And like the other movie says, build it and they will come, right? It's all about technology. You, you flip a switch, how hard can it be? Well, for our first trial for deterioration predictive alerts, the question is, were they effective? And the answer is no. And why is that? It's because our nurses and doctors look like this. Multiple phones, multiple pagers, multiple alert devices going on just around your neck and on your belt, much less what's in the, in the hospital room. All of these devices are going off. It's one of the loudest places in the world. You can actually walk down the hall and hear alerts going off all the time. And by the way, these are clinicians who are busy trying to save patients who are sick right now. And the paradigm shift that we're giving them is, hey, don't worry. You know, you have patients who look well, but in about eight to 12 hours, they might get sick. So why don't you go pay attention to those alerts? And they're like, no, why, why do I have time to do that about thinking into the future? So our first trial, our scores were displaying appropriately the time until IV fluids, blood cultures, and antibiotics, there was no change in behavior. And as a result, the number of sepsis cases, our ICU transfers, our mortality did not change. And as many other health systems around the country have published with epic sepsis scores, quote, it doesn't work. Right? Because the way we did was we jammed this score on top of existing teams, and just like with others, um, without redesigning teamwork, you don't get too far. Our quotes were, we're too busy to look. What, what, do you think that we have time to sit down and, and think this through? And part of it is that our math wasn't as good as we thought it might be, because the leadership on our team said, we need to have very high sensitivity. Our instruction to you is, don't miss any cases of sepsis. Well, mathematically, that translates to high sensitivity. And you know what's coming next, because if you choose high sensitivity, you're going to get a ton of alerts. So one nursing unit is going to get 30 alerts for every one true deterioration, right? 30 to 1. And if you can imagine a bedside clinician who's rushing around from patient to patient trying to keep them well in an acute hospitalization to say, oh, here's a sepsis alert. Let me go look at it. Um, nope, not this one. Let me go look at the next one. Nope, nope, not this one. And two or three alerts later, you go, this thing is a bunch of BS. It's not helping me. And our mathematician says, don't worry. Keep going. And somewhere in the next 30, you're going to spot one. Right? Who in their right mind is going to do that as part of their regular work? So we made incremental improvements. Right? We, know, we acknowledge that the bedside team is very busy with lots of priorities. And even if you do, have someone who says, yes, this possibly could be a sepsis case in the next 8 to 12 hours, but they look fine now. Why should I call the rapid response team? Why should I get the IV fluids? Why don't I wait a little bit longer and see, oh, yes, it, it is really sepsis, and now you're too late again. We have inconsistent response to these alerts that were 8 to 12 hours ahead of time. And so what we did was we took this team apart. Um, fortunately, at the same time that we we're building this, we were also building our virtual health center. Let me explain the virtual health center for a second. A lot of health systems, including ourselves, are now standing up centralized services where there's no actual patients, but you have connections to the electronic health record and all of the alerts and all of the sensor data from all of our hospitals. UC Health is now 15 hospitals and about 900 clinics, and we have a, a cadre of ICU nurses and physicians whose job it is to monitor the small, smaller hospitals that only have one or two ICU beds and don't have a full-time intensivist on service. And as they were doing that monitoring, as we hired the first cadre of folks, they're not very busy. There's only a handful of ICU beds they need to watch for, and they're not occupied most of the time in these smaller hospitals. So they actually, about the same time we were having this problem, they were looking at us saying, hey, we're not very busy. Is there something else you would like us to do? <laughs> like, do I have a job for you? And we gave them all of these sepsis alerts, these predictive alerts, so that their main job, they're not distracted by bedside care. They can say, I can really chew through these alerts and see what's really there. Right? And then from there, they can pick up the phone and call the bedside nurse or use our new secure chat tool to chat the right person. And then there's a major improvement in, in that workflow. So by doing this, our, our beginning was back in 2018 when we showed the bedside team these predictive alerts. And you know, in the, in the course of sepsis, there's something like 400 tasks 
in the sepsis bundle. Taking care of sepsis is really complicated. So there's observing and gathering the data, making sure you chap the, capture the vital signs. There's detecting patterns to say, yes, I think this adds up to sepsis. There's recognizing and notifying to make sure you get the IV fluids and the antibiotics ordered, and then communicating and intervening and really bringing the rapid response team to the bedside. And in the beginning, as you can see, no change from baseline after we implemented just the math piece of it. But then with the implementation of the virtual health center, we're able to get to a point where the mortality statistic drops dramatically. And by comparison, 2023 versus 2018, 800 more lives just within our health system within one year are saved from deterioration and sepsis because of this intervention, right? So say that again, the math by itself doesn't get us anywhere. It's taking the team apart and putting it back together in a different way that makes us successful. And the way you can see this graphically is that time to fluids drops by 77 minutes, time to antibiotics drops by 49 minutes, and overall we know that the, the hour of antibiotic administration changes the mortality curve. We started off at 210 minutes from recognition to treatment, we're down to 45 minutes, and the most recent stat is we're down to 30 minutes from recognition of sepsis to intervention, and that's a dramatic change in the outcomes for our patients. So, thinking about the AI predictive algorithm on the one side and the virtual health center nurse on the other side, it's kind of the idea of the centaur. What is, it's not the human horse collaboration, it's a human computer collaboration for successful machine learning. And I think this is the state of the art, the way that we can use predictive tools going forward. And um, outcomes of this work show us that our code blue resuscitation has dropped by 35%, 20% drop in the transfer to higher level of care, and, um, and this is all thanks to our virtual health center's chief nursing officer, Amy, Amy Hassel. At this point, we have one nurse monitoring 150 patients, and with technology improvements incrementally over the years, we can monitor up to 500 patients for deterioration, and now you can really scale this over a much larger uh, framework. I'm gonna to change topics to how big is big? Who has heard the tale of Persia, chess, and a grain of rice? Anybody? A uh, fair number of sophisticated nerds out there who will now remain quiet as we do the next piece of this. Thank you very much. All right, so the apocryphal story is that the inventor of chess brings his invention to the king of Persia and says, I've in invented this thing, and the king is so delighted with this invention that he says, I will grant you any, any, any prize you would like and the inventor says, well, I'm, we're poor farmers and we starve from year to year. I would just, I don't know, a couple of barrels of rice uh, to take home. Why don't we do this? Why, why, don't we, why don't you put one grain of rice in the first square of my chessboard and then double it? Give me two grains for the next square. Let's do the first row. Four grains, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128. And I'm not gonna give you enough time to do the math, but I'll give you 10 seconds to think, how much rice is that? Think about it. Okay, time's up, because that's all you get, all you get for a gut feeling. So, um, I'm gonna ask for, this is your part, audience participation moment. Don't worry, I won't call on any of you, but I want you to tell me if this is more than two barrels of rice. Not everyone raised their hand. Let's try that again. How many people think it's more than two barrels of rice? Thank you. All right, let's keep going. How many people think this is more than, let's say a barrel of rice is three feet tall. How many people think it's more than to, uh, a barrel of rice to cover the floor three feet high in this auditorium? Oh, we have some dropouts already. The answer is yes, it's more than that. How many people think it's more than the amount of rice that would fill this auditorium to the ceiling? Oh, you said more dropouts, all right. And the answer is yes. And the question is, how many people think this would fill the Gaylord Convention Center like chock full, exploding out the top of the ceiling? Yeah, some still brave souls out there. The, what is the answer? The answer is Mount Everest, or more than 1,000 times the modern annual production of rice. And I would submit to you, gut feelings have no place in exponentials. 
right? You can't sit around and go, nah, two to five years. You have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what I'm talking about. We cannot see around the corner of exponential improvement, right? If you go back and ask the CEO of IBM in the 1970s, how many of these mainframe computers that you make will there be a national demand for? And he said, four or five. We can't see around the corner, right? This is the guy who knows everything about computing, and he thinks there's a national demand for maybe five computers of that size that they were making back then, and now we have all, each have one in our pockets, right? At the same time, if you look backwards, right, it makes sense. You think, how much computing power do you have in your pocket? It's more than all of Cape Canaveral and the space program had at the time of the moon landing. It fits in your pocket. So I submit to you, we don't know what we're talking about. Moore's law. Every two years, the number of transistors doubles while price halves. And when it comes to exponential doubling, there are no gut feelings that make sense. Okay, let's move on to chat GPT. And I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Butte, for explaining AI, human-like problem solving, machine learning trained on a lot of data, deep learning with connected layers. And then we're going to talk about generative AI today. I love this. <laughs> Just to get you set for what's coming. All right. So physician and team burnout is a national epidemic. Something like 40% of doctors are thinking of leaving medicine in the next three years. There's a 29% national vacancy rate for nurses. This is not a small problem. And I think we're not done. I think among my colleagues, there are a fair number who say, I'm going to hang on for another year, and I think I'm going to be done. So we are not done with the shortage of physicians and nurses. I think it may get worse before it gets better. And so one of the things we're thinking about is, how might we address this? And this is data from our organization in terms of going back to this pandemic in March 2020 with clinic visits and appointments and so forth. And you see the red line, which we started off at UC Health, Colorado, in, uh, in 2019 with 53,000 incoming messages per month. And what's both terrific and terrible at the same time is during the pandemic when all the organizations shut down in-person visits, our patients found another way to communicate with us, which is terrific for engagement, but terrible for workload for our clinicians because this is unreimbursed work that typically occurs after hours, right? A doctor will see a full load of patients during the day in clinic or a full load of patients in the hospital and you go home, you have dinner and you pick up the computer and there's messages for you to deal with after hours. And that's gone from 53,000 messages, 183, the current number is 203,000 messages incoming per month in our organization. So these incoming messages end up for the average primary care doctor to be 20 to 40 messages per day, right? And some of these are pretty straightforward. Hey, can I have a refill of this prescription? But some of them are pretty complicated. You know, I'm not sleeping at night. My dog died. My elbow hurts. What's this rash on my shoulder? You know, I have a headache that's brand new. What are you going to do with that type of message? It can be quite challenging. So our idea was we would take generative AI which we internally called PAM chat, patient advice message using a chatbot, and draft a reply for the clinician to use. And so one thing we tried to do was have, we have medical assistants as well as nurses as well as physicians dealing with these messages. And here's an example of an incoming message. And so what did the chatbot say? No editing. You could basically look at that and say, I would have written something like that. Just hit the send button. Now, the chatbot doesn't go and do the task for you. You, you notice uh, we're still faxing, apparently. Um, <laughs> you still have to go and do the faxing. But the reply to the patient is instantaneous. You look at that, and you read it, and you go, yes, I would have said something. Send. 
decreased burden for our medical assistant, a little bit faster turnaround, and then we send it. And you notice this too. We also, in terms of transparency, thank you to our previous speaker thinking about this, this was automatically generated and then edited by to make sure that the patient also knows that AI is involved, but I have ultimate responsibility. Here's another one. And you think, wait a minute, that's not right. And that's because, right, because of training data, this chatbot stopped training from the internet in 2021 before the invention of the RSV vaccine. And so, no, that's not correct. And so as we read that, we have a weekly team meeting that goes and thinks about all of these, and we redesign our prompt for the engine every week. And one of the things that we did was we taught it, when you get an RSV question, say this. It's approved by the CDC for patients over 60, and I agree, you can get it at your local pharmacy. And so now, as the new RSV questions come in, the chatbot learns from that and is improved. Here's another example. It's kind of a wow moment. I could bring you some donuts. Would that be all right? And your gratitude and satisfaction with our services are more than enough for us. Now, I'm not sure I would be that polite at writing these <laughs> messages. And in fact, this is a problem for us because some of my colleagues who do not use the, uh, the chat-generated prompt, they say, it's too polite, it doesn't sound like me, the patient will know it, right? I'm not that nice, so that's funny. <laughs> Here's, here's one that's also a wow moment. This is the entire message incoming from a patient. Here's the reply. And you think, where did it come up with this? And the interesting thing is we are now sending to the AI not only the patient's incoming message, but the last note that the doctor wrote about this patient, which was about rheumatoid arthritis and the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis reflected here. So this is an amazingly sophisticated response from the chatbot based on something that I couldn't even understand what the patient was asking for, right? So pretty astounding at times. So anyway, the bottom line is we're at a point where we're thinking about chatbots. We're in nine clinics. We have about 200 users, physicians, nurses, medical assistants. And th there are some potholes, right? At times, the chatbot is recommending medical intervention, but all of the screening messages come into our medical assistants who are not physicians, who are not uh, advanced practice providers, and occasionally one will leak out. We had a patient who says, my heart rate is pretty low, and I wonder if I'm getting dizzy because of it. Is it my metoprolol? Which is, the answer is yes. Um, and the chatbot reply says, yes, it's reasonable to cut your metoprolol dose in half and come check with me in a few days, but my medical assistants hit the send button because the AI suggested it. And so we do have some potholes that we have to watch out for. Um, now, it turns out that when we checked with the cardiologist, they also agreed that was the right advice, but it should not be coming from a medical assistant. So there are some questions about what's the right way to give the right advice to the right person, the right human, who can, who can do the right level of, 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 of intervention. And sometimes that's licensing and, and skill of the human, not the skill of the AI. We also had another story, I'll tell you, about that. <laughs> We had an incoming patient message that said, I think I had a problem with my upper respiratory infection, which is a lot better over the last week or so. But the one thing that continues is, I still have a clear drainage from one side of one nostril. Should I, I shouldn't worry about that, should I? Right? And the AI says, trained on the internet, um, yes, you're right. This is probably a slowly improving upper respiratory infection. However, there's a small chance that the leakage from your nostril is a cerebral spinal fluid leak from your brain. <laughs> and you should probably get that checked out. And the patients come screaming into my office saying, this is an emergency, right? And so we do have to watch out because the AI is gonna have, if you don't read these carefully, go fine, fine, send, 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 and some of these will go through. So it's not a hallucination because in a neurosurgery practice, that's actually the correct answer. But in a primary care practice, not so much. So we have some work we still have to do. Do we have other work to do? 
All right, we've talked about this. Um, very briefly, um, there's a research study with 450 critical care doctors looking at chest x-rays. And for those of you in the audience, any doctors in the audience? A handful, thank you very much. Um, and then, uh, so looking at chest x-rays, it can be very difficult to distinguish between emphysema, pneumonia, or heart failure. And by themselves, uh, clinicians will spot these about 73% correctly. And if you give them a prediction AI that's trained on x-rays and that does very good job, by giving them those suggestions, your clinicians do better. Their performance improves. But on the other hand, if you give clinicians a ridiculous prediction AI and you tell them, this is a terrible AI, but use it however you want, their performance degrades. Huh. And, and we thought we were smart, right? And so the question is, that AI that you were given, which one is it? Is it a good one? Is it a bad one? How do you know how you're doing? So there are some other potholes that are coming for us that I think we need to be careful about. And so, now thank you to GPT, who when I ask, please uh, draw a doctor with new tools, will automatically draw a Caucasian male doctor. And I had to say, no, 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 how about an Asian doctor, please, right? And then, <laughs> I, I think my new tools are like uh, Ghostbusters. I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> so I think there's a, there's a trend here of having AI be right now a helper. Like, it's a helper that's built into our EHR that can help us maybe process things a little bit quicker. But where are we going? And I would love this idea, this is my idea, of a Greek chorus, right? Those of you who read, you know, uh, uh, plays from thousands of years ago, you know, the Greek chorus stands up in the back and says, oh, watch out, the hero's about to get into trouble. And I would love to have a Greek chorus speaking to me. Not just one helper, maybe there's several helpers. There's an optimistic AI who says, you know what, they're going to be fine. I'm sure they're going to get better. Don't worry about it. And then, the, and then we'll have the pessimist AI who says, oh, the, you know, I, I don't like where this is going. I, you're going to probably need to do more tests. How about a CAT scan, MRI, a bunch of blood tests? How about that? And that way, you have a range of suggestions to play from, and then you can go, you know what? I think I agree with this one, but to have an assistant, maybe a sort of a crew that's with you to think about how you improve your human decision-making, I think that's a really fascinating way to go. We have something else? Yes, and then where are we going with known unknowns, right? Before ChatGPT, no one had ever heard of hallucinations. That's an emergent property. And then where are the unknown unknowns? When will the AI be my mentor, right? And I'm going to come to work and go, all right, let's go talk to the wizard behind the curtain. What should I do next, right? And then at, when is human knowledge work a thing of the past? And again, are we going around the curve and what does that mean? Because I don't think we can see around this curve. So, overall, lessons. In sepsis, predictive AI fails without teamwork redesign. I believe technology is 20% of the solution, and the much harder part, four times harder, is redesigning relationships and redesigning teamwork. In terms of gut feeling for what's coming for us, there is no gut feeling that gets exponential improvement, either in rice or in AI. For chatbot reply, it's both great and terrible at the same time. And in terms of automation bias and automation complacency, in terms of possibly losing skill because the AI is good enough, so I don't have to pay as much attention, when is that going to come for us, right? The airline industry has the same thing, with the glass cockpit being much better at takeoff and landing. So are we de-skilling our pilots? Are we de-skilling our clinicians? And that's an unanswered question. So that's all I have for you today is unanswered questions. <laughs> And then, if you're interested in reading more about this, um, I have a blog, uh, ctlin.blog. This is a QR code to my blog. And then also books that I read that are outside of healthcare. I run a, a book club for my group of informaticists, and they are very disappointed because they are still asking me, when do we read the computer books? And the answer is never. It's the other stuff we've got to read about, communication and looking forward. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Has anyone ever heard me sing before? You are fortunate that only a few of you have. So I have a song that uh, is set to, it's a parody song about the electronic health record um, and about AI. And um, because my daughter will tell you, Dad, you can't sing. Why are you going to be on stage and do that? I'm going to request, because if any of you know Sweet Caroline, please 
jump in because it will only make the song better. And here are your lyrics. When we began, I couldn't understand you, but now I know you're growing strong. I met you in winter, AI winter melted to spring. Who'd have believed chat would come along? Replies, message replies, notes summarized, surprising you surprising me chat gpt bum 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 you're helping doctors do their best we can agree bum 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 that your help leaves me refreshed and now we look at these charts now they don't seem so daunting we analyze them easily. And when I'm tired, tiredness rolls off my shoulders. When you compose, I click agree. Replies, message replies, notes summarized, surprising you, surprising me. Chat GPT, bum bum bum, helping doctors do their best. We can agree, bum bum bum, that your help leaves me refreshed. And now I'm going 